Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with all of you and you. I didn't forget you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. First of all, your time. Second of all, your love. Third of all, whatever else you want to be thanked for. Think about it deep in your heart. What, what is something that I really haven't been thanked for lately? Thank you, kid, kid, for thanking me for it. So, all thanks out to you. Let's talk about this instrument here. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is. Because it's an incredible instrument. This is one of the most exciting sort of finds I've had in a long time. So, shaky. It was shaky. So, usually at swap meet, I get guitars that aren't really that good. You know what I mean? I slather some shit on them. Film myself doing it. Play them a little bit. Put them in a pile. Forget about them. You know? What I do, is my that's what my life's about. Right? There are times, though, where shit happens where you're like, wow. So this is one of those wow moments. Right? Swap meet recently, not too long ago, like this. It's so hot out here. I wish I had a guitar, man. And all of a sudden, I see this guitar on a table. And it was a little earlier than I usually get there, you know what I mean? Because I'm desperate these days, man. I'm like a wolf. Prowling around. Right? <sighs> Looking for that little bit of meat on the floor that was dropped by another predator. Anyway, this time I was the predator. And I got the cool guitar. You know why? Because I looked at it and I saw the label and I was like, Whoa. And the guy I saw was selling us, my friend Freedom. Freedom sells shoes. Old shoes, used shoes, shoes. He's like a clean out guy, and I've known him for many years as a swap meet. You know what I'm saying? He always, you know what I mean? He's always been good to me, always been good people to me. But in this day, you know what I'm saying? I had to get my swap meet vest on. Because, you know, I didn't know if he, you know what I mean? Did some research, because he's got a phone, he's got a label in it. You know what I'm saying? So, I was like, <clears throat> freedom. Uh, this guitar. What do you want? What do you want for it? There's nothing really wrong. It looks like the, the, the rosette here got banged in a little bit. That's about it. You know I mean? It's kind of, you know, cosmetic damage only, you know. And he's like, well, what was it worth? What do you want to spend on? I don't know. I was like, hmm. I, was like I don't know, 20 bucks? Freedom's like, okay. I was like, okay. Cool. You know what I'm saying? I was out. I was out before. He was like, G O O G L E. Where'd you go? You know what I'm saying? I was out of there. You know what I'm saying? You don't know. Do you know why the label? The label, this is a blue label Ramirez. <laughs> Some of you guitar people out there are like, oh, holy shit. Jose Ramirez. Pretty much invented the modern classical guitar. He was he's one of one of the you know what I mean up there with like you know what I mean Les Paul, Orville Gibson, you know what I mean all those other people on the echelon in guitar world. He's like you know what I mean oh Leo Fender, you know what I'm saying he's one of those people. You know what I mean? Jose Ramirez, I think in 1882 in Madrid started making guitars and his guitars that he made himself. Or worth like their price. They're like you know what I'm saying. They're like the equivalent of like a like a Stradivarius. You know what I mean. They're they're just you know what I mean. They, they don't you know rarely come up to market when they do. It was 1880s Ramirez Jose Ramirez. So he had a little shop. Instruments para Rondalla. You know I, mean? I believe that's the name of his shop. It's still there to this very day. You know what I mean. And they're still their high grade instruments. He's dead, by the way. He died. That was 1882 and started. He can live forever. But I don't know if it's still family owned, but there's still some kind of people in there turning out these expensive guitars. And that's cool, man. And that's cool. Now, when the guitar explosion happened in like the late 50s, early 60s, you know what I mean? Ramirez was like, man, 
you could really move some units you know, man, man. Mm -hmm. so he set up a whole entire or his grandson or you know I mean, business partners nephew whoever the fuck was around in that time period set up a whole like in instrument like they're making Ramirez guitars left and right <laughs> and some of them were still high end you know what I mean Ramirez like real fly but most of them had blue labels in it because you know what I mean they were just worried about you know it was quantity over quality by that point and so the blue label Ramirez you know what I mean those are the ones that had one little incident happen they'd be worth really not that much money still worth some money because they're Ramirez guitars I'll tell you exactly what happened Going recording of a hard day's night, George Harrison says, I'd really like to get a Ramirez guitar to play on this track. You know what I'm saying? I think it was, and I love her maybe, right? And Brian Epstein's like, yeah, that'll be arranged, that'll be arranged, you know? So Brian Epstein called up some people. Yes, yeah, so, uh, one of the chaps wants to get his hands on Ramirez, and I'd like to get my hands on Ramirez too. <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, yeah. What do you mean it's not available? That's impossible. It's George Harrison. It is Brian Epstein, motherfucker. And so George Harrison was not able to get a real Ramirez. He got a blue label. But that for everybody owning a blue label from that period. You know what I'm saying? This isn't the George Harrison blue label. It's not that model. But it is a blue label. They're highly sold after now at this point because they're very collectible. Seems to be worth some money back there. Seems to be worth some serious money. Fix it up and clean it up right. It's a Jose Ramirez blue label right there. I'm going to flip you around and show it to you. I'm so excited. They actually, the Ramirez company reissued the George Harrison model recently and they reproduced the blue label. And those are even sought after. Those are even sought after. So we're going to look at it together. We're going to restore it together. You, me, everybody that watches this, one family. Together, I'm gonna flip you around. We're gonna enjoy it. Kind of peaceful matter. Just touching and handling this instrument, you know it's like a fine instrument. Even if it's their low end budget line, you know what I'm saying? It's a fucking gorgeous instrument. You know what I mean? It really is. I feel like blessed that this happened to me. Look at that. Oh my. Oh my, the label itself is worth its money in gold. Look at that, man. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous instrument. I'm examining it, I'm just, this is the big fucking, looks like somebody took a hammer. Like, Fuck your Ramirez. This is some real artist and shit. From what I understood, the people from Ramirez went around, found all the local artisans they always admired, who did all the artisanal guitars and instruments, you know, which at that point was sort of disappearing, and they put them to work in a big warehouse. Under like, you know what I mean? The Master Luthers from Ramirez. Building designs that they wanted to, you know what I mean? Get out there. It's like a weird imperfection in the rosewood, isn't that? Or maybe a paint. I'll have to take a look at that better the laboratory. I don't know. what we'll to see if it comes off. It looks like it's like a... I don't know, man. Let's see what we can do about it. Tuners. Still fine as wine. Probably one of the, the, the big things, the difference between this one and one of the big expensive ones are the tuners. Those are probably made out of like, you know what I mean, part of the Shroud of Torn or something, man. They're real. I love that binding. Look at that. So this is definitely a, like a lovely instrument. Possibly will be my favorite guitar. You know what I mean? Just because I always wanted one of these, really. Ever since I saw Hard Day's Night, man. I was like, look at that cool guitar that George Harrison has. It's like a, I can remember, you know what I mean? I have a little calendar from when I was in high school. I still have it just because of the little pictures of their guitar. I used to look at this calendar over and over again. Now I'm going to go get it. Hang on one second. Check this out, man. This is a 1993 Beatle calendar. <laughs> January. There it is right there, man. January, he's holding that beautiful Ramirez. Courtney with that Hofner. This old John Lennon with his J160E. Ringo. You know what I'm saying? Looking like he's, you know what I mean? Check this out, man. This is this. This old Billy Joel. Right? Little concerts. Check that out, man. My birthday. 
I remember that. It was my favorite. Okay. I was off of work on the 4th and the 5th of November, 1993. Isn't that cool? Just so you know that. Anyway, memories, memories, memories. So here I got one. I own one now. Isn't that cool, man? So let's get in the laboratory. Start working on it. All right? Let's start working on it together. I'm excited. Can't you tell? Just as, think about that. That's 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Isn't that incredible? 30 years ago. <laughs> mm, welcome back to the laboratory. Take a look at that headstock real quick. Huh? Take a good look at it. And let's take a look at the back of it. I want you to notice this. I want you to notice the hump here. Just the way it's shaped and everything. Huh? Now I want you to take a look at this. This is a it's a German, uh, like, a rare instrument auction site. And they got all their old sales. You know what I mean? And I pulled up all their Ramirez's. This Ramirez one. This is from 1895. Right? This is, uh, you know what I mean? Without a doubt, Ramirez one. Look at the headstock. We should take a good look at it. Look at the headstock on there. Right? Look at the shape of it. Look at the curvature. Uh, look at the shape of that headstock, right? Well, let's go back. Let's look at Ramirez 2. Right? Ramirez 2. This is 1941 Ramirez 2, right? Let's see. Ramirez 2. Numero dos, mi amigo. Por favor. Here's Ramirez 2, right? The same thing. I want you to take a good look. Look at that instrument completely. Look at all the attributes of, of Ramirez too. Right, look at this. Right, let's take a look at this. Right, look at the headstock. Let me get you a better look. Take a look at the headstock. I want you to see it. Same as same as same as dad, right? Same as his old man. Exact same way. Right? There's no, you know what I mean? It's there's no difference. It's this, it's this headstock, right? Now I'm gonna Google. I'm gonna Google Blue Label, Blue Label '60s, just Blue Label Ramirez guitars. Give me one second. Put headstock in there because I want to prove a point. Look at all the different headstocks on the, you know, Blue Label, on the Blue Labels. Would you look at them? None of them look like that at all, right? I had all these artisans working in like in a factory. All artisans running around. They were just some of them working at home. You know what I'm saying? Turning them out. Let me show you George Harrison's one. George Harrison's one right here. It's like an inverted, sort of like a Gibson one. You know what I'm saying? Let me go back real quick and show you Jose Ramirez. His debut, his third one. I want to explain something to you. Here's 19, 1967, right? Look at his head stuck. You know what I'm saying? This was different. He, de he deported. You know what I mean? The norm. He's the one who changed it. When he debuted in the late 60s, right? So, Jose II, he was ailing then, you know what I'm saying? He was he was down for the count, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't really making guitars. It was all his people making guitars. Now, I'm telling you all this because there are basically three websites about Ramirez guitars and their labels. There's one that's run by like a crazy, you know what I mean, person that works for the Ramirez company, like a young researcher. You know what I mean? Like myself, brash, collecting every picture they can find, making claims just based on pictures. You know what I'm saying? This is at not Ramirez. This is blah, blah. And then there's one that's actually put up by Ramirez the third or fourth, whatever. Saying, honestly, before 1967, there was no, you know what I mean? Well, here's a signature label, label. Here's this label. They just put whatever label in that they could find. You know what I'm saying? There was no, you know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking, basically, this was probably made by 
you know, in one of Ramirez's people, old time people in the Ramirez shop. And what happened was they just couldn't get this blemish out. Because I can see this has been polished out. There's blemish in the rosewood. Maybe try to stain it. You know what I'm saying? So like, fuck. You put some cheeseburg tuners on it. You know what I'm saying? Sold it. You know what I mean? That's what I'm thinking. Maybe. Right? Maybe not. But we have to worry about this right now. This is what what we're here to do. Now, there's damage to the wood slightly. You know what I'm saying? But look inside there. That's not made by just a fool. You know what I'm saying? This is, it's got all kinds of supports. If I put you inside the guitar, I wonder if I can get you in there. You'll see there's supports on the top of it. Here, let me see if I can get you in there. That's it. Interior of the guitar. Look at the, look at the roof of the guitar. Look at those little braces. Going across the roof of the guitar. You know what I'm saying? That's like a master instrument. This isn't made by some kind of, you know what I mean, artisan. You know what I'm saying? This is made, look at the rounding on the base of the neck block. Look at the rounding on the base of the neck block. That's professional. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened here. We got to treat this thing. Now, what I want to do is wet this down. Not too much because I don't want these colors to run. A little bit. Put pressure from the back. You know what I mean? Fill it with glue. Two block, a back, on, and a front block. And just let it set for a couple of days with glue in there. Hopefully, we can get that shape back. Because I can feel the indentation in the back. If I can put a little piece of block there because there's a brace. There's like a long brace. There's also on this side. Very, very well braced. But right here, if I get it right before the brace, I can push it up. See that? So let's start doing that. Let's start getting the, the little brace ready, and I'll show you when we're all wetted down. All right, so five minutes ago, we applied some real hot tap water. This area right here, and the wood kind of puffed up again, which is good. I mean, it doesn't look as bad, but it, it's only cosmetic. It will dry. We put a half a plastic bag over our, you know, collector's label there right we don't want any you know on that took two little pieces of a fat tongue depressor put them on top of each other and taped them right next to this brace there's like a nice fat brace here so that way when this pressure is applied here the whole thing goes up perfectly exactly the way we want it to go up we have a nice piece of wood here you know what i mean for the for the back brace we got that already so we're going to take a whole bunch of glue wood glue and we're just going to smear it in there we're going to take the old suction cup and we're just gonna get as much in there as we can you know what i'm saying and dry it off as much as we can and then finally when it's, it looks good enough piece of wax paper over there put a piece of plastic glass and a piece of real flat board right on top of there and we'll get a clamp in there and just clamp this guy tight for a couple of days right we'll try to even that out i don't know how good it's gonna be but at least it's gonna be structurally a thousand percent and it's not gonna look that bad see you in a moment and there it is people it's all clamped up you're going to want to clamp it so you hear like a... You know what that is? That's the wood going back in place. Maybe it work. Maybe it will not. Who knows? You know, let's keep our fingers crossed. We're not too sure here. Let's give it about a day or two in this little get-up. We didn't need a block on the back after all. You know what I'm saying? Just didn't need it. It was not necessary. See you in a day's time. <laughs> all right. So we're about 24 hours almost to the T when we clamped it. I know that when we unclamp it, it's going to be somewhat structurally more sound. Let's see if it's any better off cosmetically. Let's get these clamps off. It's damn near perfect. You only see these little scratches. But I mean, feeling it, the rosette feels pretty, I don't feel any bumps at all. And the rosette, the rosette feels normal. You can feel these scratches, but that's only like a, a cosmetic kind of thing now. So let's put a little tiny bit more glue. Pop a little bit more glue in there, just a little tiny bit, just to seal the deal. Not too much that it's gonna, you know, loosen the old glue. It's a real quick fix, you know what I'm saying? And I'll see you there. All right, so we put a little bit more glue in there. That glue will sort of just seal the deal. Try to keep as little water and moisture away from, you know what I mean, the cracks as possible, you know what I'm saying? Looks good. This, this glue, dries like real clear it does you know what i'm saying it's actually the clearest wood glue i've ever seen so let's let that set for a little while when we come back we're gonna start talking about the old freddy 
Freddy or not, here I come. You can't hide. See you in a few. T- All right. So I did it like three times. And after dry to put some more on, dry to put some more on. Well, you know, a little bit of overkill sometimes goes a long way. And I went all around the whole rosette because, you know what I mean, feels like the little woods that were used in this particular rosette shrank up a little bit in places. It happens, you know what I mean, depending on where the instrument was stored. So let's talk about old Freddy here. You ready for Freddy? So you can see from this shot right here, that shine on the first fret. And it looks like, you know what I mean, they're doing their best to try to minimize this or do something to make this look less, you know, and everything they did probably made it look worse. So the first thing we want to do, and it says only that one fret, <laughs> we, we want to knock that shine off. Let's take a piece of steel wool and just get in here and knock that shine off. We're going to do a full fret job on this guy because it's a fine instrument. You know what I'm saying? It's probably the, the best instrument I pulled out of flea market in a long time. You know what I'm saying? I'm very, very happy about it. That's a that's a you know master. It's a master craft instrument. It's an instrument crafted by an old world master, and it's just beautiful. You know what I mean? With all the little trims and trappings. So I want to do a good job on it. And the round over needs to be attended to a little bit because it feels like you know what I mean. The the, the fretboard sort of maybe shrank in it by you know what I mean a hundredth of a millimeter even can can throw things out of whack when it comes to the round over. It's a weird sort of thing. We're going to do a full fret job on this master instrument because we want to get the best out of it, right? Right? You know I mean? Too bad they put all these cheese bird tuners on it. You know what I mean? But they look functional. And they look factory. You know what I mean? With the with the uh, slotted screws. You know what I'm saying? In the mid-60s, sort of. You know what I'm saying? At least they're nice. You know what I mean? There they were even worse ones around at the time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's when they first came out with the... Uh, I was thinking of taking these screws out of here and putting like like slotted screws to make it a little bit more dignified. I'll have to think about that. I'll have to think about that, Tony. Right? Let's get working. Let's get working. Let's 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 flatten this out. All right. So it's all flattened out. I don't even want to touch it because it oils from my skin. It'll leave a big in, imprint on there. I also did a couple of the other ones. You can see so many tooling marks on these. Looks like it's had a fret job recently. It looks like it was done. The fret job was done by an amateur, you know, which kind of sucks because this is a, like you know a world class instrument, which kind of makes it look as if this instrument may have been, you know what I mean, just like a blue label. I'm also thinking these might have actually been replacement parts put on later. I was looking at it. I don't want to take them off. Maybe they used the original screws. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it seems to be like a, an anachronism with this particular instrument. I'm not going to take them off to figure it out. <clears throat> so let's blacken up the frets. This has obviously been like the second or third fret job we're doing. The frets have been pretty chopped. You know what I mean? They're pretty close to grade. So we want to be careful. Up here, they're a little bit, a little bit more chunky. But down here, especially, they're real small. So let's let's color these guys in and let's see very carefully. You know what I mean? where we stand right even though the trained eye like old gate kit we want to do it right on this guy because it's a special instrument seeing a merment all right folks so we got all the frets blackened up with our sharpie i know i've showed you this a couple times before it's the first time we've done it in a long time so some of you new people might not know what we're doing we're gonna level the frets we have a piece of sandpaper 200 grit rubber cemented to the bottom of that spray rubber cement that is we're just going to run it up and down until we've gotten all this off. You know what I'm saying? In a careful way. Then we're going to take a fret file and we're going to work on it. I just want to show you these terrible, terrible. Look at those tooling marks, man. Oh, my God. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. Whoever did that fret job last time did a very, 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 very amateur job. man. All right. So the frets weren't really in that bad of shape. You know what I mean? The. Marker pretty much came off, was wiping us on, you know what I mean? They were, they were level, at least. We get the round over to an absolute perfection with one of these guys. It's a soft, you know what I mean? Sand and block, it feels gorgeous. You have to be real careful with that. And we use the fret file, you know what I mean, on this beautiful instrument. I'm going to show you the fret file in case you don't know what it looks like. Get it here. So, you know, we use the, there's one side that's a little coarse, and when there's one side that's a little fine. We use the fine side, which 
pushed and when we got up here where we couldn't really do the round over and then we individually did it like with the nub you know what i mean on each side so we got perfect perfectly done so let's go wipe off all the, sh the shit you know what i mean that's like all these little shavings and shit i want to just try to address this real quick let's see if we can address it if we can't we'll just move on just like ramirez did <laughs> All right, so we got it wiped off, but not like vigorously wiped off. And we got all the schmutz off it, but we didn't, you know what I mean, like polish it. You know? So it's still a little rough. We're just going to take these furniture markers from the Dollar Tree. We're just going to, these are rare. I haven't seen them in the Dollar Tree any time recently. Tool bench, they're the best brand. It's made out of pure human skin. Let's just try to darken that in right now before we start, you know what I mean, polishing up the fretboard, right? Let's see if we can do it. Fuck it. It'll stay. You know what I mean? For a while, at least. <laughs> and there it is. Looks great. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Perfect. So, let's pretty much take a little bit of steel wool, some mineral oil, and let's just carefully polish off these, you know what I mean, frets. I don't know what's going on up here. There's some stuff going on here. Like I said, there's lots of, you know what I mean, tooling marks let's try to bring those tooling marks down mineral oil quadruple zero steel wool i'll see where we're all greased up careful around here you don't really want to break through those furniture markers right you know what i'm saying and you can just take that off if you ever wanted to you know what i mean take it off i think it comes off easily with alcohol you know what i mean those dollar tree ones i don't really know what they're made out of but they're always like a godsend it looks great you know what I'm saying unless you play the shit out of this you know what i mean and, once we get some wax on there, we should be permanent on that. Right? Well, I say that, but, you know, who knows? Could be by Glamour Shots. It looks like shit. I'll see you when we're all greased up. Polished out. When we're greased up as the situation requires, hoss. What do you want me to do now? Wait 30 minutes and then wipe myself off? I looked here carefully what was that was going on there. So there's actual scratches in the rosewood. It's been hacked up and by even sanding it out, you know, we, we run the risk of, you know what I mean, not having enough wood to seat those frets. So we're just gonna leave that. I might give it a little color, you know what I mean, so it doesn't look <clears throat> I don't want it to look so, you know what I mean, pertinent. And the color we added up here, I mean if you really look at it, and I got the flash on right now. I take the flash off. You know what I'm saying? No flash. Shit don't look like trash. You know what I'm saying? It's just the way we the way we roll. You know what I'm saying? I remember when I first met my wife, she said, Don't ever take any pictures with the flash on. Everything looks like trash. It's true, man. But when you're filming a vlog in your basement, the flash is your friend. I'll see you after we wipe up the grease. Alright. So we wiped it all off. Doesn't that look great? Doesn't look spectacular, spinomular. And our mineral oil is not like an organic oil, so it doesn't dry. You know what I'm saying? It just stays wet and tolerable for a very long time. That's why it's good, like, if you know what I mean, you can't take a dump. You know what I mean? It keeps you greased up for quite some time. It's good. So, what we're going to do is let it sort of just breathe a little while. And then we're going to coat it with the... Uh, Butcher's wax, real butcher's wax, and that'll keep it dark for a long time because it'll keep that little little layer of oil, you know what I mean, like wet for like at least for like 10 years. Or like that. It takes a long time, you know what I mean, to sort of, you know, go go sour again with butcher's wax, man. That's why it's a secret, man. That's why it's all get kid secret. And now you know, so it's not really a secret anymore. So let's move around along. Let's let this guy, you know, sort of like just, you know, seep out that. This is Brazilian rose where we want it to seep out a little bit more. And you see how, we look up here, these are a little bit more fine. They're a little bit more fine-tuned. We sort of like, we don't want to sand it off too much. You really, also, it fills in those little deficits, you know what I mean? We didn't put any color on there at all. It's just straight out, straight out. So I got some old Dollar Tree furniture polish. What does it say? What does it say? I don't know. What does it say? I don't know what it says. Let's spray it on there. You know what I mean? Clean up everything else. Let's keep it away from the fretboard. We don't want to. Don't worry if a little bit touches it. But I mean, we don't want to. You know what I mean? Look at this beautiful binding. You know what I'm saying? 
Let's see how wet this thing looks. Maybe we'll put some mineral oil on that. Yeah, let me just get it wet. Let's clean it up with some of my old furs pile. See how it looks. See how it looks down a second. Hold on. All right. So we're all sheened and shined up. Spiffy. See that? Beautiful sheen. Beautiful shine. Hey, I want to keep my plastic over my label. Trying to demonstrate to you the beautifulness of life. So, what I'm going to do, first first thing I'm going to do is this little mark here, this little scuffle. Let's just take a little piece of crayon. I think this is probably about the right tone. That's just for future reference. To help along what I'm about to do. It's going to like sort of hold, hold in the liquid. Hold in the liquids, the liquids I'm about to use. This is the liquid I'm about to apply to the guitar. Generally, I would use my own Wilbert lemon oil, but I'm kind of raiding my wife's cabinet because I got two kids, and, and like she keeps the furniture looking pretty good, and they're fucking can be barbarians. I want to put it right there where I just put some, you know, what I mean, right in here, which is dried out, right over here, and right here, and right over here. This is like lemon oil penetrates. See that? It says. It penetrates, penetrates and replaces Woods Natural Earls. Leaves a freshy limon skint. I like skints. The skints and the skanks and laugh, especially right here too. See where you see the impact mark of the damage. It's all like totally flat now. But if you look at it carefully, you can see exactly what got hit. I want you to get a, get a good look here. I want you to see it correctly. See, I hit like right here, right there. That's, you can see the marks. It's totally flat now. That's crazy, man. It's crazy. Barely even see it. Didn't even know what happened. Let's get all arled out, right? With my two old friends here, Parker and Bailey. They were in the Civil War together. Then they became lovers. And I looked next to him in the bed, and he was hurt, too. He was smoking on the opium pipe, too. And that's when we got to know each other a little better. <laughs> I don't know what the, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, man. I don't know anything about these guys. I'm sorry. My apologies to the Parker Bailey families. Oh, man. So, we treated it, especially here. Look at that. You can't even see where it was. You know what I mean? That. Tell you that crayon's another get kid trick. That's just correct. We didn't have great luck right here though. That's a pretty bad gouge. You know what I mean? I don't want to penetrate it too much. You know what I'm trying to say to you. I want to keep my penetration down to minimal. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna let it sort of just dry out. We've greased it, we've oiled it, we've slicked it up. Let's wait for all this earl to sort of just congeal a little bit. And then we're going to wax it up. And I'm going to show you exactly how we wax it. And just, you know, you guys don't have to wait. I do. One, two, three. All right. So it's been about four or five hours. Time to wax this girl up. All right. That's what we're waxed up now. These are my traditional waxes of choice, man. This is for the body. And this is just for the fretboard. This is readily available. This is very hard to get a hold of. But I have enough, like, little scant bit at the bottom to... Take care of all my rosewood for the foreseeable future, so I'm not too stressed. All right, so let's get that. It doesn't even really look like it needs it at this point, but it's going to, you know what I mean? And uh, I'd rather do it now while it's disassembled. You know what I mean? Let's see you are all waxed. Super sheen. Super shiny. Yeah. Isn't that nice? I didn't know where the guitar ended and the old newspaper began. This is so beautiful. It's beautiful. We got a nice, you know what I'm saying? Beautiful thing going on that rosette. Nice. Two little scratches to remind us of some damage. We got it right shine a light on it. You know what I'm saying? Look at that. You can barely even see it. You know what I'm saying? You can barely even see it. I mean, if you look real close, you can see it. 
for all intentions and purposes, it looks pretty, pretty desilatory. So let's put the strings on. Man, what strings are we to use? Got some cheapy beefy, man. What? What? You're not gonna put no savarez or nothing on there? Nah, you know what? I think that a good guitar speaks for itself. Doesn't matter where you get the strings. These are good strings. I gotta tell people, man, the Chinese strings are really good. They are. I'm not to tell you, man, they got all the equipment to make it from us. You know what I'm saying? We don't have any of that left. No, we don't. No, we don't. Look at that label. Exact label that was in George Harris and the guitar. I'll talk to you about that in the glamour shots. Beautiful, masterful instrument right there. Gorgeous sounding, gorgeous looking, gorgeous feeling. Full scale instrument, 25.5 inches. 650 millimeters for your metric freaks. It is what it is, man. You know what I'm saying? Very close to George Harrison. Same exact label. It's George Harrison. When you first got it, when they are filming Hard Day's Night, he said, I want you to focus inside the guitar to see the label. I want everybody to see a Jalo Ramirez. Watch Hard Day's Night. You can see when he's doing And I Love Her. You can see that exact label on fine there. So, I mean, in 1960, with the Ramirez company, would they give him a shit guitar if he asked, or would they give him a nice guitar? Ramirez says only two of the George Harrison guitars were ever made, and one was a studio version prototype. Is what they're saying now. The Ramirez company right now is being run by Ramirez the Fourth's two kids. Now Ramirez the Fourth, unfortunately, he died very tragically when he was young. His kids were very young at the time too. He died in two thousand, right after he made that timeline on the internet about the label saying there is no rhyme or reason to the labels. Trust me. But now his kids are running the company. I think his sister ran it for a number of years until they came of age. And they learned how to make guitars and stuff, you know. And they're trying to push a different story. They're saying that Randaya were all instruments made by other companies, not made by Ramirez. That's what Randaya means, right? Well, that's not what it means. You know what Randaya means? Well, Jose Ramirez the first, his, comp his family came from, from Aragon, the kingdom of Aragon, right? Aragon, of course, where King Ferdinand came from, right? Now, there's a type of music in the medieval times that came from Aragon called Rondaya, right? It was sort of like an informal street orchestra. And all the, the, the string instruments were all plucked with a pick. So, instrumentos para Rondaya, that means instruments designed to be played with a fucking pick. That's what it means, Right? These new kids don't know that, even though their family was involved in it, and that's what they made these things for. So just because it's a blue label doesn't mean it wasn't made by Ramirez. It means it was made to be played with a pick. George Harrison was a picker. We all knew that. You know what I mean? I don't think I ever seen him much play you know, other than a ukulele with, a, with a, you know what I mean, his fingers. But in the early days, he was never, you know what I mean, finger picking, right? Was he? We didn't see him doing it. So Ramirez is, of course, going to give him a guitar made for finger picking. That's what Right? So you know. Just so you're aware. You know what I'm saying? Don't believe everything you read, even if you're reading it right from the horse's mouth. Now, they're also trying to sell a story that the guitar came through Klaus Vorman, because there's no records of them ever giving it to. Well, there's no records of anything Ramirez, really. They just have a bunch of guitars and stories passed down. But, you know what I mean? Third hand, because, the, you know what I mean? The father died really young. So we don't really know too much details. Other than the small you know, web pages that he put up himself right before his passing. So let's hear it, man. I'm so tired of talking. You know what I mean? Klaus Vorman probably didn't give George Harrison his guitar. But if he did, I was looking into the story. He probably traded the Ramirez guitar for the duo jet. Because it kind of lines up the time he supposedly gave Ramirez guitar to Harrison. It was the same time that he gave the duo jet to, to, to Foreman. So he probably traded if if it is a true story. That's an aspect that's not promoted by Ramirez. Let's hear this fucking thing. Too bad the tuners, you know what I mean, such cheese birds. It's the only bad thing about the guitar. They're really bad tuners. You know, it would really behoove me to get better tuners on this guitar. Maybe I will if I start playing it a lot. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just leave it the way it is. But I want you to hear it right now. From the bottom of my blue label. My rondaya. Jose Ramirez. Instrumento para Rondaya.
This was produced technically, I believe, under Jose the Third. He was like King Tut in a way, where he was like the current sort of Jose Ramirez is. He was like very young, and although he was an able man, it was his father died in '57. And his brother, I think, is his older brother Albert, I believe. He took over the business end, and he was supposed to be like the creative end. And then he died. Albert died, and it just this guy Jose Jose the Third had some problems with that, you know. And so for a couple of years, you know, he sort of he didn't really get onto the helm of things till like the mid '60s, late '60s, is when Jose the Third started really like. And then I believe in '69, Jose the Fourth took over when he was like 19 or something like that. But Jose the Third made a lot of changes. He changed the headstock. He like streamlined the different, uh, you know, materials being used, the finishes, things like that. But I will say about this instrument, it's one of the cleanest, clearest sounding instruments I've ever played. sound good with fingers too I'm doing it for the pick this is kind of a rondaya. <laughs> so uh, people are like are you gonna play you know George Harrison and I'm not gonna play it I'm not gonna play it because you know what I'm saying I'm not gonna do it it's a good song though and I love her I'm gonna do a special get kid treat and I have like five or six viewers, right? Maybe seven viewers sometimes if it's a controversial guitar, you know? <laughs> I actually had somebody, hey man, play some Donovan. I don't know, if, you know what I mean? They're putting me on or not. I think I played Donovan before. On the Ecuadorian episode, I just send up with Atlantis. I know that. I might have played Donovan before. Because I remember I had a picture of me meeting Donovan. I remember looking for it. I don't know if I showed that to you guys. I don't know where you know exactly is right now. Or I show it to you again. Because I want to talk to you about Donovan. Because that guy mentioned, hey man, play some Donovan, bro. Remind me of this unknown Donovan song. Really. Donovan was recording the Hurdy Gurdy Man. That's the album that had the Hurdy Gurdy Man on it. Right? The person who got everybody lined up in the musicians was actually John Paul Jones, the bass player for Led Zeppelin. And he pretty much lined up all Led Zeppelin except for Robert Plant. He had Alan Parker and Jimmy Page on guitar. He also had um, Nicky Hopkins on piano. He played piano on Angie for the Rolling Stones. He played on the Imagine album. Not the tr Imagine track, most of the other songs on that album. He played Electric Keyboard Revolution for the Beatles and Nicky Hopkins, you know what I mean? He was like Great Britons, you know what I mean? These Great Britons out in John without a mouth, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, ma'am, he died a while ago. I think he's one of the first ones to die from like a 60s thing. Nicky Hopkins, man. Anyway, so there's a, there was a song as a B side. It was the B side to Hurdy Gurdy Man. It was not on the album. And I remember I was big into Donovan, and like my mom had a whole bunch of 45s. I saw the Hurdy Gurdy Man 45, I believe, on an epic label. I believe it was yellow. And I was like, wow, that's a like, Hurdy Gurdy Man. And I flipped over. There's a track called Teen Angel. I'm like, Teen Angel from Donovan. And it was a real sparse sort of arrangement. It's got Nicky Hopkins on piano, Donovan on guitar, maybe John Paul Jones on bass. But it's an awesome little song. I'll play a little couple bit of it right here. Now that you're in Sing for 
wash those hands. Jose Ramirez, the fifth or the fourth or the sixth, whatever we're on right now, wash your hands too. I think it's also being run by his sister as well. So peace be with all the Ramirez family. This is a beautiful instrument. This is not something to be embarrassed of. The Rondaya series is something to be proud of. Your family's from Aragon, the great kingdom of Aragon. And, and the Rondaya instruments, that's their big legacy. Remember that, Ramirez family. Don't shun it. Don't shun it. We all have our squires in life. Very, very. Sooner. Ooh, I'm going to knock over this instrument over here.